Good morning. I, uh, I wish I could say something to you all in Malayalam, but I don't know any Malayalam. I could uh, speak to you in Spanish. Buenos dias. Um, probably many of you understand a lot of Spanish also. But uh, it is a, a great honor to be able to be here this morning sharing with you and uh, opening God's word together. Uh, once again, my name is Micah Tuttle. Like the brother uh, in, introduced me. Uh, my wife's name is Amy. We have six kids. Uh, we're just kind of getting started recently. Uh, so the Lord's blessed us with uh, several kids. We have uh, our oldest is 20 and our youngest is uh, four years old. So um, the Lord's blessed us with uh, three boys and three girls in the wide age range. So uh, we have been in Peru for 18 years and uh, the Lord's really blessed the ministry there. Um, my whole family's there right now and I'm greatly missing them. I can't wait to join them uh, on Monday. Uh, I'll be there and then we'll be taking a trip uh, with uh, about 20 people. We've started a discipleship program um, and we just spent the last month in Dubuque, Iowa with the students uh, studying through the scriptures and uh, really studying about evangelism and discipleship, church planting and missions. And uh, now the whole team and my family is in, uh, is in Peru and, and preparing. When I arrive, I'm going to take them on a serious jungle trip. We're going to have about a 100 kilometer trek where we're going to go from village to village to village. We're going to be crossing rivers and slogging through the mud and eating monkey meat and wild boar brains. And uh, it's going to be an exciting time. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, if any of you would like to uh, form a team and come visit us in Peru, that would be tremendous. Uh, we actually had a team of uh, all Indians from Kerala that visited us several years ago and, and went in our boat with us and visited several of the villages and we had some children's meetings and uh, a couple of them were doctors and nurses and we set up a clinic and uh, uh, I can definitely give you an unforgettable experience if uh, you went with us on a trip into the jungle. And uh, actually the Indians that, that came with us on that trip, they commented that where we live and work there in the, the northeastern part of Peru is very much like uh, Kerala. Uh, a lot of uh, plantains, a lot of green, um, uh, the jungle foliage, the rice fields, um, everything uh, uh, apparently is very co comparable to Kerala. I've never been to Kerala. I would love to go someday, but uh, um, where we live in, in Tarapoto, Peru is uh, very similar, the landscape anyway. Um, if you would open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6. And um, obviously the, the story that we're looking at during this conference is chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, the flood of Noah. And actually I'm supposed to be kind of emphasizing the practice of mankind at the time of Noah and how that compares to the practice of mankind in today's day and age. And it is amazing to compare the, the times of Noah, of what we know, just reading the few verses here in chapter 6 and comparing it to the day and age in which we live now and how the end of the ages has come upon us and the comparison between the time of, uh, of Noah and our time and the utter depravity and sinfulness of mankind and our brother tremendous job last night speaking about uh, those same kind of things, but uh, now to kind of emphasize once again and looking at these things, and what I really want to try to do also is bring out the gospel as we see it in these chapters and in this story and how there's a comparison between what happened in the past and what will happen in the future, and what happened at the cross and what happened also in the past at Noah's Ark. Um, so I'd like to emphasize some of those things. Let me read chapter 6, verses 1 to 12. No, 1 to 13. I'm reading from the ESV version. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any that they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim, or the giants, were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, 
and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was very great in the earth and that every intention of his thoughts, of his heart, were evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Right from the beginning of the Bible, we see, see that man utterly corrupted himself. And just as in the days of Noah, we look around today, utter corruption, violence, wickedness, evil, all around us. And Lord, it's in our hearts. We're part of that wickedness and evil and violence. We need a Savior. Oh God, I pray that you would help me to say the words that you want me to say. Just because we're at a conference where a bunch of believers have gathered together does not mean that all are believers. There are unsaved people that are listening to this message and that will be here this weekend. And we pray that you would convict by your Holy Spirit and by your word. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to draw near to him during the course of this, this weekend. He's our only hope. He's our ark. He's the way, the truth, and the life. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We come before you this morning, crying out to you in these difficult times in which we live. The end of the ages has come upon us. One day, it will rain again. But the next time, fire and brimstone that could happen during our generation. God, I pray that you would put into our hearts a sense of urgency. Those of us who are believers to go out with a sense of urgency, making Christ's name great and warning the world around us of the wrath and judgment to come. Pointing people towards Christ our ark. Pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, speak to me as I just preach these things to myself. Put this time into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Once in, in Peru, as uh, I was driving in our car, our van, had my family with me, all of our kids and a couple of Peruvian brothers and sisters were in our 12-passenger van, and we were driving from a town of Moyabamba to Tarapoto. It was about a two-hour drive, and uh, it's a paved road. Actually, that section is uh, very well-traveled. And um, I was going around one curve, and there was a whole bunch of cars that were parked there and a whole bunch of people that were outside of these cars, and everybody was waving at us wildly and, and yelling at us to stop. Parense, parense, telling us to stop. And, and, and I thought, these people are crazy, huh? 
why would I stop? And I kind of thought to myself, they must, they must run a ride or something. And our van was full, so I just continued on. And I went around the curve, and I kept on going around another curve. And then around that curve, there was a, a couple of other people that, that were waving at us wildly and saying, stop, stop. And I thought, man, the people in this area, they, they must be drinking. The, the, they must all be drunk. Or maybe the, the water has something funny in it. And they're all trying to call for me to stop. And I thought, uh, well, I don't have any room in the, in the van to take anybody. So I kept on going around the, the next curve. And there a, a woman ran out of her house and she was yelling and waving at us to stop. And I thought, man, everybody in this, this area here, this sector is, is, is crazy. I came around the next curve and there were big rocks that had been placed on the highway. I slammed on my brakes and came to a stop. And there were about six men in ski masks with machine guns. And they had about 10, 10 people all on the ground, tied up. We had driven into an assault. We had driven into an assault. These people on each curve before this one had tried to warn us. They had tried to say, stop, no, don't continue on. Warning, warning. And I did not heed their warnings. And I found myself in the middle of an assault surrounded by men with ski masks and machine guns. Many times we hear the message of the gospel. Maybe on the radio, maybe by your mother or a believer that's, that's a family member, and we reject that, and we reject it, and we reject it, and we reject it. And we just continue on. You hear me messages on the radio, you hear messages from, from the pulpit in different places at conferences or in church, and, and you just ignored the message. You've also almost become inoculated to the gospel. I'm preaching to believers here, I think, but I know within the crowd, some of you are pretenders. You've even grown up in brethren assemblies, but you've almost been inoculated to the gospel because you've never responded to it. Or maybe some of you listening through the internet to the recording or listening to this and, you, and you've lift, listened to the gospel so many times, but you've just rejected and you've rejected and you've rejected or, or you've just ignored it. Like I ignored those warnings. Right here in the scriptures, we have a major warning. What will you do with Christ? What will you do as judgment day approaches? What will you do as the end of all things draws near? Just as the end of all things drew near in the days of Noah as he's building the ark. And can you imagine... What the days of Noah were like, as it talks about right there, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of his heart was always and continually evil. Verse 11 says that the earth was corrupt in God's sight. The earth was filled with violence. Behold, it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And you think about the days in which we live now. First of all, it talks here in the beginning about giants on the earth. And I do have my opinion about the interpretation there, the sons of God going into the sons of men, and the result is these giants. So this version says Nephilim, which is actually translated giants, but these giants are on the earth, men of renown, and then this is a hard passage, and there's different interpretations there, and I do have my interpretation, and I think that I won't go into it at this time. You can talk to me about it afterwards. But what I want to point out right here is there were giants on the earth. We're facing giants today also. The giant of the homosexual agenda. The giant of Islam. The giant of internet pornography that has so many men, even women, just chained. Addicts to pornography. Everywhere I go and I preach against these things and I find men and women, they're just, they can't find freedom from pornography. 
I actually, I was given a room here in the hotel and I'm all by myself. And immediately I texted my dad, my wife, and two really good friends, and I wrote them, I'm in a hotel room all by myself for three or four days here. Pray for me and hold me accountable. Immediately the temptation's gone. I know that they're gonna be asking, my wife knows, my dad knows, two really good friends, but pornography, we're facing the giant of pornography. In the days of Noah, I don't know what it was like, but obviously there's something that's going on here in the first couple of verses of some kind of sexual immorality that pervaded the earth. We live in those days right now. The giant of abortion, the blood of millions of babies runs like a river across this nation, condemning the United States of America. We're living in the days of Noah, facing the, the giant of divorce, the giant of racism, the giant of alcoholism, the giant of drugs, the giant of terrorism, the giant of evolution. That whole agenda that, that's come in through our schools and the educational system, all of those giants that we're facing, the giant of atheism, giant of relativism, the giant of materialism. I know that that is a big problem right there for many of you. The giant of materialism. Many of you are doctors and engineers, businessmen, very well educated. I'm amazed, almost every Indian that I met is extremely educated. You guys are the smartest people on the planet. And some of you make a lot of money. And the danger is materialism. Here in the United States, that materialism has just sucked us in. And it's destroying your families. It's destroying our families. The giant of materialism is huge in the Indian American culture in which you guys live. Warning, warning, don't get sucked in. We're facing giants on all sides. A giant of suicide among the youth. The giant of euthanasia. All these giants that we're facing. Think about the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Have you ever told a lie? We've all lied numerous times. Have you ever stolen anything? Even something small, cheating on your taxes just a little bit. That's stealing. When I was a kid, I used to steal pencils from some of my classmates or steal candies. I used to like fishing a lot, and so I used to go, I'd go out and I'd actually steal fish hooks from the local store that sold some fishing equipment. And I thought, it's so small, what's the big deal? Stealing is stealing, one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And then Jesus says in the New Testament, if you even look at a woman to lust for her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Going back again to the problem of pornography. using God's name in vain. So many people just, it just is a natural way to speak. You're a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart that blasphemes the God who created him. We've broken all of the Ten Commandments, and at the times of Noah, the corruption, the evil, the wickedness, just like today, we're getting to that point once again. Listen to this, and I want to make this comparison. Judgment in the past and judgment in the future. God judged this world in the past, and we see it in this story. In the worldwide flood, God judged this world with water. And he's promised that once a day, once again, he'll prom he, he will judge this world, but with fire. I imagine in the days of Noah, as Noah is beginning to build the ark, and, and it maybe seems that, that God says 120 years from now, I'm going to judge this world. It, it, it's not really clear if that's just putting a, a limit on man's 
uh, length of days. Now they're not going to be living almost a thousand years. Now it's limited to 120 years. And that obviously is true. Something happened right there. But it could be that uh, also God is like, okay, Noah, build the ark. They've got 120 years. So possibly, possibly here it's referring to also Noah is, is building an ark. And he's got 120 years. And imagine during that time as he's building this ark, He's a preacher of righteousness, Peter says in the New Testament. And I imagine he open air preached every once in a while. Maybe he went to a certain street corner of the main square in his town and he would open air preach and the people would gather around and they liked to, liked to listen to Noah. Noah was a good preacher. And they come to listen to him, Noah, Noah, what, what's the message for today? And Noah would say, it's going to rain. It's going to rain to rain. It's going to rain. Get in the ark. It's the only way to be saved. Get in the ark. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. And we know that mankind at that time, except for his family, rejected the message. Just like today, the great majority of the world is rejecting the message. Maybe Noah had a brother in assembly that he had started there in town. His family went and just a few attended there. But uh, Sunday morning he comes in and, and the brothers and sisters, or supposed brothers and sisters, said, hey, Noah, what's the message today? What's the message that you're going to preach this morning? And he'd say, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Get in the ark. It's the only way to be saved. Get in the ark. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Warning. And even those that attended his brethren assembly rejected the message. They did get into the ark. Are you a true believer? As I was, I was on my knees praying over this just a few minutes ago in my room before coming out and just hit with, some of you are just religious, but you don't have a real relationship with the Lord. And I just plead with you this morning, and I want to say, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. Just as Noah preached that, You've got to get into the ark. Imagine around the breakfast table, Noah and his family, his wife and his three boys, sitting there eating toast and maybe idli for breakfast in the morning. I love idli. And they're sitting there eating and one of the boys, Shem, says, Hey, Dad, what's the devotional for this morning? You always share a devotional in the morning. What's the devotional? And Noah said, boys, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Boys, get in the ark. Get in the ark. Warning, it's going to rain. Everywhere Noah went, he preached the same thing. 120 years of it's going to rain. It's going to rain. If you guys listen to me about maybe 15 times after that, you're just going to be like, Micah, you just preach the same thing over and over and over again. Noah preached the same thing for 120 years. That was the main point. It's the main point today. Everywhere I go in the world, my message is, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It rained once. It rained once, H2O. Water that destroyed this whole planet, worldwide flood. And God has promised that he will make it rain once again in the future. But the next time, it will be fire. It is going to rain. Get in the ark. You know, you look at the fossil record today, and evolutionists like to look at the fossil record and they point to it and say, look, evolution. You know what? We should look at the fossil record, and basically the fossil record is billions of dead things 
buried in rock layers, and those rock layers have been laid down by water all over the earth. The fossil record screams, there was a worldwide flood. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers, and those rock layers were laid down by water all over the earth. It screams. The Genesis account, Genesis account is true. It talks about a worldwide flood right here, and the fossil record screams, God judged this world once, and he's promised to do it again. Get down on your knees and repent. That's the message of Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 9. The, the message of the fossil record. It's not evolution. The message of the, 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 the fossil record is God judged this world once. He's promised to do it again. Get down on your knees and repent. Let me read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 through seven. And the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Repent. 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 This was Moses or this was Noah's message. It should be our message. Oh, do you feel the urgency? As I read the scriptures and study and memorize and spend time praying and just the urgency the end of the ages has come upon us. Brothers and sisters, this ought to inspire us to go out with the gospel. Preach the word. Get out of the bubble of our brethren assemblies. Preach the gospel. Make disciples. Plant churches. Missions. It may be that the the Lord returns during our generation. Are you ready? How will the Lord find you living? Noah, right here, it says in verse 8, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Man, I want to be like that. Micah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Not because of anything that I've done. Only by the merits of Jesus Christ. Put your name in there. Roji found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Benoy found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I can safely use the name Thomas. Thomas found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Be that man. Be Noah in our generation. Judgment fell on the earth at that time, just as judgment will fall on the earth in the future. And we just may be living in that generation where judgment falls on the earth once again in the form of fire and brimstone. You think about judgment and you think about the justice of God. And Our brother talked about the justice of God last night and very, very great point. Let me give an illustration, the judgment of God, because I talk, I try to do evangelism every day and going out into the streets and talking with individuals and sometimes open air preaching even. I'm one of those crazy, weird people, but I just feel the urgency. We need to be preaching this. Several times I'll talk to people and they'll, they'll really kind of chafe against the justice of God and really emphasize, no, God is love and, and, and so everybody's going to be saved. Yes, God is love, but the other side of the coin is God is just. You know what? The scariest doctrine in the Bible is this. Kind of hold on to your seat. This might scare you so badly that you fall off of your chair. So hold on. 
The scariest doctrine in the Bible is this. God is good. Nobody fell off their chair. This should scare you. If God is good, what does a good, I mean a really good, as in holy, 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 just, good, that is good. What does a good God do with a bad man? Justice must be served. He cannot cover his eyes to your sin. He cannot cover his eyes to the fact that I am a lying, thieving, adulterer at heart that blasphemes the God that made me. He can't cover his eyes to that. God is just, and therefore he must punish sin. The great dilemma that you see in the scriptures, if God is just, he cannot forgive you. God is holy, therefore he hates sin. God is just, therefore he must punish sin. But then the next point, God is love, and therefore he has provided a way where he punishes sin. But those that repent and trust in Christ, that get into the ark, they'll be saved. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Get in the ark. <coughs> Let's say that I go out and I steal a car in the parking lot. And I drive into downtown Dallas and I shoot a few people along the way. Then I go into a bank and I steal a few million dollars. After that, I, I, I'm continuing down the highway. Finally, a whole bunch of police are going after me, and, and, and they catch up to me. They, they capture me. I spit in the policeman's face. They take me before the judge, and the judge says to me, you've murdered people? You've robbed a bank? You've broken all kinds of laws? I'm going to have to sentence you to life in prison. And then I say to him, oh, judge, but I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And the judge says, oh, you're sorry? Oh, it's a good thing for you. I'm a loving judge, full of grace and mercy. I forgive you. I let you go. And he lets me go, and I walk out free in the street. Is that a just judge? No. That judge is more corrupt than the criminals that he should be condemning. That's great that he's loving and he's merciful and he's gracious, but that kind of judge is not just. God, our God of the Bible, combines love and mercy and grace with justice. Justice must be served. The wrath of God must be poured out. On the sinner. And that's what we see at the cross. Look at another comparison here the ark and Jesus. One way of salvation. There wasn't any other ark. Noah built this ark that God commanded him to, and it was the only way to be saved. Just as today, Jesus is our ark. There's no other way to be saved. Jesus himself said, I'm the way, the way, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Those words are totally and completely exclusive. He excludes all other religions, all other ways, all churches. All methods of trying to be good and do good and try to get to God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. Only through Jesus. One mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. The Bible's very clear. One way. One 
ark. Noah preaching. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Get into the ark while there's still time. Just like we should be preaching today. It's going to rain. Get into the ark. You know, basically, there's two religions in the world. Two religions in the world. One that has a thousand names. Buddhism, Islam, Shintoism, all kinds of names that you can, even different branches of Christendom. Catholicism, I'll just say evangelicalism the way it is today. It's a big joke. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, all these names that you could put for religion, and basically they all say the same thing, be good and do good, and in the end, you'll be all right. The other is biblical Christianity that teaches it does not matter how good you are, how religious you are, you have still broken God's high commands and requirements. All are under sin and all need to get into the ark. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That's the message of the Bible. Come to Christ. He's mighty to save. And that's the message right here. Get into the ark. Get into the ark. Once at our house in Peru, in the jungles of Peru where we live, lived, now we're based here in the States, at least for a time, but uh, once in our house, we were asleep at about 2 in the morning, sleeping in our mosquito net. And uh, there's a wall around our house, which is also a Bible institute that's functioning the students down below. But there's this wall around the house. And once at about 2 in the morning, I heard this noise at the window to our house in the kitchen, at the window in the kitchen. And so I, I woke up and, and I, I went into the kitchen and I, I went to that window and I pulled back the curtain and I found myself nose to nose with a thief that was trying to get into the window of the house. He had climbed up over the wall and he had snuck around to the back of the house and he was going into the window of the kitchen. And so when I pulled back that, that, that curtain and I found myself nose to nose with this thief, I, I screamed, ah! And he screamed, ah! And he went running and he jumped over the, the wall and went running down the road and, and he escaped. You know, if you want to visit me, you need to come to the front door. Don't jump over the wall and try to find a different kind of a window that you can get into the house. And come at a proper hour, not at two in the morning. I'll open up the front door, you can come in, it'll be a great time, we'll have a, a, a great conversation, it'll be wonderful. That's like the religions of the world. They're trying to create some back door into heaven. Or trying to get in through a different window. When Jesus says, I am the door. Jesus is the only door. No other door. The ark was the only way that this generation in the time of Noah could be saved. Just as Jesus is the only way that we can be saved during our generation. Another comparison here that we see between what happened at the ark and actually the cross of Jesus Christ. Wrath, the wrath of God rained down on the ark. The ark had to shed that water. The, the rain pounded down on top of that ark just as the wrath of God pounded down upon Jesus as he died on that cross. Six hours of the wrath of God raining down upon the sun. Wrath rained down on that ark. And can you imagine, as everybody's in the ark and the animals and everything, and all of a sudden, it begins to rain. And maybe it started out kind of sprinkling, but then I just imagine, and, and the text doesn't say it, but I imagine big raindrops we're talking raindrops like bombs 
I don't know, 100 pound raindrops falling out of the sky, pounding onto the ground and onto the ark and exploding onto people. Those raindrops coming down, boom, 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 crashing all over the place. The wrath of God falling upon this earth and falling upon the ark in the form of water. Those that were inside the ark were safe. Those that are inside Christ, that are in Christ Jesus, are safe. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Get in the ark. Get in the ark. It rained that day. Thinking of the wrath of God, and you look at the cross of Jesus Christ, and you know, if you, could, if you could just hear each blow of the hammer on those nails that nailed Christ's hands to the cross and his feet to the cross, if you could hear the blow of the hammer, every blow of the hammer, you should hear, God punishes sin. God punishes sin. God punishes sin. God punishes sin. Because that's exactly what was happening. God was punishing sin that had been imputed to Jesus. He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Our sin was imputed to Jesus, and God punished that sin at the cross so that we don't have to suffer that wrath. And then Jesus imputes his righteousness to the believer. If this message is boring to you, and you're just like yawning, when's Micah going to... Stop talking about things that we already know. If this is boring to you, you're not a Christian. This is what we're all about. Christ died, satisfying the wrath of God. And you see that in this story right here. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. The wrath of God was poured out on this earth one time about four or 5,000 times years ago in the form of H2O, water. And God has promised in his word, he's going to make it rain again. Are you in the ark? If you're in the ark, you're safe from the wrath of God the Father. God the Son paid it all. You think of the days of Noah, and, and, and at this time, all of the sinfulness and wickedness. And then you look at Romans 1, and, and those things are, are happening today. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. We're living in those days. That's exactly the kind of days that we're living in right now. The days of Noah. The practice of man. Another thing that I want to point out right here. Saved by faith. Noah and his family, they were saved by faith, just as we are today. They had to trust, they had to have faith that the ark was going to float. They had to get in that thing. They built it on dry land. I don't think there is, it doesn't say that there is any test period where they took it out to a lake and they went around, yep, no leaks, it floats. 
No, 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 no. That was a big ark. They weren't transporting it over to a lake to test it out. They got in that thing and they had to trust, they had that faith that it was going to rain, like God said. They had that faith that God was going to make this thing float. Noah had never built one of these things before. And they get in. By faith, they're saved from the flood. Just as we're saved by faith today. Faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, the faith that saves is three parts. If you think about it. Emotion, information, and an act of the will. Emotion. I know it's going to rain. I want to be saved from the wrath of God when he rains it down on the earth. I've heard that there's an ark. I want in that ark. I want in the ark. I understand it's the only way to be saved. That's emotion. But that kind of emotion, it starts there, but emotion doesn't save anybody. Be really, really careful with emotion. There are a lot of churches, entire denominations and movements that are completely controlled by emotion, but they don't have the right information. You need information for saving faith. You need information about that ark. Where's the ark? Who's the ark? How do I get into the ark? That information, fundamental doctrine that we see in the pages of the scriptures. Jesus is our ark. We need to know who Jesus is, what we're saved from, what we're saved to, who God is and all of his attributes and his holiness. Do you have that information? Study the scriptures, God's word. Are you reading it? Do you hunger and thirst more and more for God's word? The information, give it to me. But it doesn't even stop there. You need to actually get into the ark. An act of the will. Turn your back on sin and run to Christ. This is kind of this, it's a simultaneous behavior. I'm not saying... First, you have to turn your back on sin and clean up your life and then go to Christ. No, 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 no. But when one runs to Christ, you can't run to Christ without, at the same time, you're turning from one thing to turn to another. You're turning your back on sin. Let me give you an illustration. In Alaska, they say that uh, Eskimos, they hunt wolves by first hunting a deer or a caribou. There's a lot of those. Those are easier to hunt than the wolves are. So they'll hunt a deer and they'll take the blood of that deer and they will freeze it onto a double-edged knife that's extremely sharp. And so they get this big ball of blood frozen onto the blade of a knife. And then they leave that frozen ball of blood out in the forest. And then the, uh, the wolves, they come and they, they smell the blood and they love blood. This is, the, this is the best meal possible. And so they start to lick that ball of blood and they're licking and they're licking and they're licking. And you know what happens? Soon they get to the blade and they're licking and they lick that sharp edge of the blade and it slices their tongue. And it hurts, but it tastes so good. More blood that's beginning to sprout, from, uh, come out of their mouth and, and their tongue, and they're licking the blood, and more blood, and it hurts, but it's so good. And before they know it, they kill themselves. Eskimos come along the next day, and they find a couple of dead wolves there. What an illustration of sin. For your love of that ball of blood, your love of sin, and vice, you're killing yourself. You're destroying yourself. You're sending yourself to hell. Turn from the ball of blood. Turn from it and run. The only one to run to is Christ. He's our ark. He's mighty to save. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's the bread come down out of heaven. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the resurrection and the life. Come to Christ. 
He is our ark. They were saved by faith as they got into that ark. Once again, the, the saving faith involves emotion, information, and an act of the will. Bringing those three together, the saving faith that we see in the Bible. I could preach a whole message and I don't even know what time it is. I'm probably going way over. I'm getting all excited. But uh, we could go to Acts chapter 16, verse 30, 30 to 33 and look at all those points come out in the Philippian jailer. We're not going to go there because we don't have time. But Noah and his family saved by faith as they get into that ark. And can you imagine people outside that did not get into the ark? Noah didn't shut the door on him. It says in chapter 7, verse 15, the Lord shut them in. The Lord shut that door. And everybody that was outside, friends and family of Noah, those that maybe attended his brethren assembly, where they spoke Malayalam once in a while? I don't know, I don't know. But, but, but some of those, and friends and neighbors, and those that heard him preach in the streets, a preacher of righteousness, can you imagine when God shut that door and this, everybody, the door just shut by itself. And then people standing there and it begins to rain. And the water begins to rise, and, and then explosions of water, the, the deep, the great deep breaking up, and geysers bursting forth from the earth, and water is flooding from below, and water is coming from, below, from above, and these people are, are floating on logs around the ark, and, and they're just pounding, Noah, open, open up the door, Noah, we believe you now, open up, and they're slamming and, and hammering at the door and trying to pry it open with crowbars, Noah, Noah, please, and people are drowning. We talk about Noah and the flood, and a lot of times it's this story for little kids, and it's this cute little ark, and there's giraffes, and there's this, there's this elephant, and there's a, the rainbow, and everybody's, you know, having a great time, and it was not like that. This was a horror movie. Hollywood made a movie of the ark, and it's complete heresy. I don't know why you could make the ultimate horror movie just following the biblical text right here. Would one of you young people please be a movie producer, a Christian movie producer that does it right? Just do Bible stories, but do them biblically. I'm convinced you could make an awesome movie out of this story and out of lots of other ones. Can you imagine the panic at this moment? screaming and yelling and pounding at the door. Noah, let us in. Too late. Too late. Listen. It's going to rain once again. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Get in the ark. You get into the ark who is Jesus Christ through faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God hath prepared before him, that we should walk in them. By grace you've been saved through faith to get into the ark. Oh, there's so many things to say. I, have no, I don't even see a clock. I, am I over? Give, give me a little, just a little more time. Another comparison. So we've seen judgment in the past. The world of Noah was judged. Just as in the future, our world will be judged. It rained and it's going to rain. Second thing, one way of salvation. The ark in the days of Noah was the only way to be saved, just as now Jesus is the only way to be saved. It's always been by grace through faith. You've always, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you come by faith in the grace that God extends and offers. The majority of mankind is rejecting it. There's always been one way. Get in the ark. 
Another comparison that we already pointed out, the wrath of God rained down on the ark just as the wrath of God rained down on the cross or rained down on Jesus, God the Son, at the cross 2,000 years ago. Those of us that are in Christ, we're in the ark. Noah and his family were in the ark, are saved from that wrath of God that poured down on the ark. And then saved by faith. They trusted that that thing was going to work. Just as we trust in the promises of God that we find in the Bible. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now lastly, a new creation. In chapter 9, when Noah and his family and the animals get out of the ark, they walked into a completely new world. Yes, it was the same planet, the same earth, but it was totally different. A worldwide flood would rearrange the continents. It seems that before this, all the landmass was in one area and the rest of the planet was, was seas. We don't, I don't know, I don't know for sure, but that's what it seems like. And after the, the worldwide flood here, you can almost see how, looking at a globe, how, how the land would fit back together. Uh, but a worldwide flood dividing the continents as, as the waters receded, carving huge canyons, the Grand Canyon, maybe forming mountain ranges, Everything on this planet was completely remolded and formed and shaped by a worldwide flood. Just as, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you're a new creation. Noah and his family walked into a new world. Just as you as a believer have walked into a new world. 2 Corinthians 5.17 the old is gone, the new has come. We're new creations in Christ. Noah and his family walked into a new world. Start over. A new world. You as a believer have walked into a new world. Once as I was preaching open air on top of a table in one of my villages along the Huachaga River, which is a tributary to the Amazon in the jungle there in Peru, I was preaching in... The whole village was listening that night and the Lord really seemed to work and the Holy Spirit was convicting a lot of people and this drunk guy came forward. I didn't even ask for an altar call. I was just preaching and this guy came forward and he was just weeping. And he got down on his knees and he was repenting of his sins and, and he was crying out to the Lord for deliverance and I talked to this guy for a few hours afterwards, and, and he was broken. He was drunk, and so I kind of thought, I don't think that this is real, but the Lord can do miracles in people's lives. And a month later, I visited that village, and the man was transformed. The man was transformed. This man had actually escaped from a prison in one of the jungle towns of Iquitos, and he had escaped to one of these small villages out in the middle of the jungle that isn't even on the map. And he was actually on Peru's most wanted list. But I preached the gospel that night. And this guy, he made a profession of faith in Christ. And the Lord transformed him. This guy's on Peru's most wanted list. And he's one of my best guys. The guy loves his wife. He loves his kids. He actually named one of his kids Micaeus after me. So he's got to be a great guy. Completely transformed guy. And going to the other villages, and now he's planted different churches there. And he's always going out, and he's preaching the gospel open air. And, and he's just, everyone in his village knows this man, he's a transformed guy. He's completely different. A new creature. He entered into a new world. A whole new life. And that night, when he came forward, I remember him just saying, after he had trusted in Christ, he just kept on saying, I'm new. Soy un hombre nuevo. I'm a new man. The chains have fallen off. I'm free. I'm free. A new creation. That's you as a believer. That's me as a believer. If you haven't experienced newness of life, 
If you're still held by the bonds of sin and chained and you're just a slave to pornography, a slave to materialism, a slave to status, prestige, or maybe some of these other things, I, I don't know, but are you saved? Let's say that this morning I went for a jog and I was out jogging along the freeway and if I told you that about an hour ago before the meeting, I was out there and an 18-wheeler semi-truck was going about 75 miles an hour and I kind of uh, slipped and I kind of fell into the freeway and it just plowed right over me. It smashed all the wheels just right over the top of my whole body and my face and everything. And now I come to you this morning and I'm preaching to you and you see me and you see my face just as uh, uh, handsome as I am right now. No evidence that a truck ran over me. Would you believe me if I told you that that truck ran over me an hour ago? Would you believe that? And you're looking at my appearance right now? Would you believe me if I told you a truck ran over me? No! You should not believe me if, you, if I say a truck ran over me an hour ago. It just smashed me. And you look at me, but you're not changed. If you really had a run-in with the truck, if it smashed into your body, you would be completely transformed. You, you'd be flat as a pancake. You wouldn't be speaking to us this morning. You would look different. Don't tell me that an encounter with a semi-truck is more powerful than an encounter with the living God. If you've had an encounter with the living God, you will be changed. You will be transformed. I'm not talking about sinless perfectionism, but I am saying that a true believer bears fruit. It might be two steps forward and one step back, three steps forward and two steps back, but over the course of your life, you will make progress. The parable of the soils, some bore 30, some 60, some 100 fold, and that was the seed that fell on good soil. Some Christians bear more fruit than others, but a Christian bears fruit. Noah and his family, they walked into a new world. Just as you as a believer have walked into a new world, a new life. Can anybody tell? Is there evidence? Faith. Are you really in the ark? One day that door will shut on this generation. And there will be people outside as it is raining down fire and brimstone. And they will be screaming, let us in, let us in. Yeah, we believe you now. Open the door. Hermanos, brothers and sisters, friend that's not a believer, I plead with you. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Get in the ark. Jesus is our ark. Let me end with this. A few names and titles for Jesus, who is our ark. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the Amen. He's the apostle of our profession. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the author of eternal salvation. He's the branch. He's the bread of life. He's the captain of salvation. He's the chief shepherd. He's the desire of the nations. He is the door. He is the faithful witness. He is the good shepherd. He is the great shepherd. He is the shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He's the heir of all things. He's the Holy One of God, the great I Am, Emmanuel, God with us. He's Yahweh. He's the King of the ages. He's the King of the Jews. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the Lamb of God. He's the light of the world. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the Man of sorrows. He's the mediator. He's our Messiah. 
He's the morning star. He's the prince of peace. He's the prophet. He's the resurrection and the life. He's the root of David, the shepherd and bishop of our souls. He's the son of David, the son of man, the son of God, the son of righteousness, the true light, the vine. He's the word of God. He is our ark. Let me say one more thing. Skip back to chapter 5. This is extremely interesting, Genesis chapter 5. I know, I know I'm going long, but don't worry about me. I'm not tired. In Genesis chapter 5, it's a genealogy. This is fascinating, though. In Hebrew, and I don't know Hebrew, but one of my professors of Hebrew, he taught Hebrew in Old Testament, showed us this and how in Hebrew, each one of these names has a meaning. And if you just read the meanings, you come up with the main point of the rest of the Bible found hidden in a genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 that leads up to Noah. Look at this, Adam. Adam means, chapter 5 verse 3, it says Adam. And, and then he had Seth, who had Enosh, who had uh, Kenan, who had Mahalalel, who had Jared, who had Enoch, who had Methuselah, who had Lamech, who had Noah. And if you just look at the meanings of those names, write these meanings down if you can write them quickly. Adam means man. Adam means man. Seth. Seth means appointed or appointed one. Enosh means mortal. Ke Kenan, in verse 12, Kenan means sadness. Mahalalel in verse 15 means the blessed God. Jared in verse 18 means will come down or comes down. Enoch in verse 21 says, or that his name means teacher or teaching. In verse 25, Methuselah, that name means his death brings, which is fascinating. Because if you look at it closely, the year that Methuselah died, the flood came. So Enoch gave his son a name, Methuselah, which is, the meaning of his name is actually a prophecy. When this guy dies, it comes. The flood comes, and it came the, the year that Methuselah died. Lastly, or no, second to last, Lamech. His name means the desperate one, or desperate ones. And Noah, his name means comfort and rest. So if you wrote those down and you just read the meanings of the names, this is the message that you get. Man, appointed, mortal sadness. The blessed God comes down teaching. His death brings the desperate ones comfort and rest. If you add in a couple of articles there and make them complete sentences, you've got like three sentences that put forth the rest of the gospel message that you find in the Bible. Man is appointed to mortal sadness. We see that as this earth is completely trastornado, completely messed up because of sin. Man is appointed to mortal sadness. The blessed God will come down teaching. We see that in Jesus Christ. The Messiah came down teaching. His death brings the desperate ones comfort and rest. Because of the death of Christ and his resurrection, we who have believed in him, the ark, have comfort and rest. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Get into the ark. It's the only way to be saved. He's mighty to save. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the great I Am, Emmanuel, God with us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for each one that is here. But Lord, I pray that you would not leave us comfortable, that you would not leave us in peace, until we've truly come to the ark 
and entered in. Lord, there are some here this morning or some listening through the internet that have not gotten into the ark. I pray that you would not leave that man, woman, boy or girl in peace until they enter into Christ. Combining together those three things of a saving faith, emotion, information, and an act of the will. We place our lives into your hands. We ask that Christ would come quickly. Come, Lord Jesus. Pray that you would work in our lives and in our hearts and convict us of sin. And we pray that we might live in the newness of life that Christ brings, being born again. Pray that you would do something great in our generation, that you would spark revival in our assemblies, in our families, in our personal lives. Lord, I pray for the men, that men would be raised up like Noah. Noah found favor in your eyes in the midst of that wicked generation. Oh, Lord, raise up men like that that would be preachers of righteousness. I pray that you would spark revival, not man-made or fabricated, but something that you do by the power of your Holy Spirit based on your word. We thank you for what you're already doing. Convict us of sin and help us to live victoriously in the power of the Spirit. We thank you for this the story of Noah and the ark, and we pray that you would help us as we continue to consider these things throughout the course of this weekend. We put our lives and the rest of these days into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.